It was billed as the last chance to stop the worst ravages of climate change. But a watered-down agreement in Glasgow has left many wondering if it's all too little, too late. This is The Great Debate. We'll be getting to the heart of the issue dominating the headlines. This week on The Great Debate, the climate crisis and whether the world has done enough to slow it down. Our viewers panel, drawn from across the country and beyond, will share their opinions, they'll have their say, and they'll put their questions to our studio guests. Joining us this week, Christiana Figueres, the UN climate chief who delivered the last global climate agreement. Allegra Stratton, the Prime Minister's spokeswoman on COP26. The leading climate activist, Michaela Loach and the former Australian Foreign Minister, Alexander Downer. And a little later, we'll also be joined from Los Angeles by the film director, Richard Curtis. The big question facing them all tonight, has the world done enough, or are we now facing runaway climate change? A two-degree world means that a billion people will be affected by extreme heat stress. We do not want that dreaded death sentence. They're one of the lowest emitters of carbon emissions, yet they are the country which is really feeling the most impact. It seems like for world leaders, nothing matters for them. It's corporates, it's business, it's money. Coal is so important to this area and to this community. India has fought successfully for that change in the fossil fuel tax. We can be immensely proud of what has been achieved. Today we rest and tomorrow we organise again. Right, let's get on with it. Let's go to the wall, our viewers panel. And I'm going to start with Liz Langfield. I think you are in Newcastle, Liz. That's right, Trevor. Good evening. Good evening. You've got a I thought think... on this question. Yes, I have. The, I, I'm conscious how hard everybody has worked who have been delegates at the conference, but I'm also conscious that a lot of this, particularly from the UK, appears to be lip service. We talk about our new oil field, our new coal fields, and yet at the same time we talk about climate reduction and carbon reduction. We talk about... Um, making environmental changes, and that doesn't seem to happen. We talk about planting trees, but our uh, target has been 30,000 hectares per year of tree planting. One hectare is about one football pitch, and that target has seldom been met, and we've got the same target going forward. Oh, 30,000 hectares of tree planting. We know that wetlands capture a okay. great deal of carbon from the atmosphere, and yet we are damaging our wetlands with uh, all this sewage that's being allowed to leak out into the sea. It's being pumped out into the sea. 400,000 litres, gallons of the stuff, was leaked last year, released into our waterways. And we now know that the MPs have decided there will not be any penalty anymore for doing that. So my question is, are the COP26 commitments just like New Year's resolutions that will be broken very quickly? <laughs> Thank you, Liz. So let's come into the studio. Crack of a start. <laughs> Liz's question, are COP26 commitments like New Year's resolutions that will be broken very quickly? Well... Allegra. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I just jump in? Thank you, Liz. Um, I think that they are New Year's resolutions from countries that have already kept last year's New Year's resolutions. And let me show you how. The UK has already, Liz, um, 
cut our, our carbon emissions at the same time as growing the economy. So on 1990 levels, we cut carbon emissions by 44% and the economy went up by seven, more than 75%. So we, we, we have a proven track record. Um, the areas in which we were asking for progress on in Glasgow, coal, cars, cash and trees, were areas where we had already demonstrated. So, for instance, Liz, on coal, uh, in 20, 2012... Sorry, I'll, I'll just let me just... Because it seems no, to me important... I wanted, it's to, important clear it. I wanted to, to clear up one thing, but finish what you're okay. going to say. It's important to Liz that, actually, I show her what we've done already rather than what we're about to so, so, uh, so, on coal, 2012, 40% of our power generation. Now it's 1.5%. And in 2024, goodbye. No more coal. Anyway, I can tell I'm testing your patience, so I won't go through yeah. all the others. <laughs> but the point is... We've already walked the walk. And what we, the United Kingdom presidency, was trying to do in Glasgow was say, in so many ways, we've already done it. It is possible. Let's go further. OK. I just wanted to get clear, because you said uh, in that answer to, to Liz that the economy had gone up uh, yeah. by 75%. And yeah, I, I'm the, sure that didn't quite what you meant. The, the economy, the, we've managed to grow the economy over the years at the same time as cut our carbon emissions. Oh, uh, over years? Over years, and okay, I've sorry. said from 1990 yeah. levels. So the point okay. is, it is possible with the, with the change in the okay. type of tech we are now using, with solar and with wind and so on, it okay. is possible to, to do both things. It is possible to see economic growth at the same time as change the way that you're, you're generating your power. So we, all I'm trying to say is, okay. we've already done it. That's that's why she should have confidence. OK, Michaela, you, uh, you are uh, looking mildly sceptical. Yeah, incredibly sceptical. I think that it's... Um, I think it's false to say that the UK is walking the walk. That is just absolutely not the case. Whilst the UK, who say they're climate leaders, are trying to approve new coal mines in Cumbria, also are trying to approve new oil and gas fields um, in the North Sea. None of this is what a, a, car, like a climate leader would be doing. And I just don't think it's completely unfair to say that emissions have been being decreased in the UK, where now we just export so many of our emissions off to other countries, which then we blame for the climate crisis. The UK exports so many emissions because manufacturing emissions are not um, included in a lot of the um, kind of statistics that are used, which means that the people who, the kind of where our stuff is made is not being included. There's a lot of like creative accounting that happens that makes it look like the UK is much better than it actually is and instead blames these countries where we actually get a lot of the stuff in our lives from. And so I think that whilst the UK is going against the advice of the International Energy Agency on approving, saying that we shouldn't be approving any new oil and gas fields, we shouldn't be approving any new fossil fuels, and they're still trying to approve the Cambo oil field along with 39 other oil, gas and coal projects, they cannot say that they are walking the walk. That is absolutely ridiculous. And I really kind of sympathise with people who feel like these are maybe new as... Um, like resolutions that aren't going to be kept to you. And I think that's why it's important for people power okay. to keep our governments accountable. Um, Christiana, I'm not, I'm not going to ask you to adjudicate on uh, a British argument, but Liz was really uh, raising the question about whether all governments have really uh, have been consistent in what uh, they said compared to uh, what they have done. What, what do you think has happened since you negotiate that agreement at Paris? Have governments really delivered on what they said they'd deliver on? Well, sadly, I would say it is uh, mostly the countries of the north, of the global north, that have not delivered on their promises, especially on supporting developing countries with the necessary finance that is necessary for those countries to be able to make the transition that is important to them, but also to the rest of the world. The, uh, the, the most painful example of that is the famous 100 billion that were promised years ago. Uh, and they were supposed that was to be- 2012, right? Yes, and they were supposed to be flowing by 2020. And here we are at the end of 2021. And we know that this is going to go into 2022 at least. So we already know that there will be at least a three-year delay. So that is, uh, it is very concerning that you can add to other things. So I think one very understandable conclusion that is reached by many is that trust has been broken, trust has been breached. At the same time, we have to understand that this is not either the vision of, I don't know, a satanic vision nor an angelic vision. This is not perfection and this is not disaster. This is a transition okay. and all transitions are messy 
by definition. So I think depending on the glasses that you want to put on, you can go out there and you can argue like Allegra just argued everything that she says is actually part of the reality. And what Michaela has just said is also part of the reality. That's the difficulty that we have, that we have to be able to Uh manage different realities in equal standing. Thank you, Christiana. Let's let's accept Christiana's point that this isn't going to be black and white. Uh, I think that's unrealistic. But let's see what lens our wall has on, what lens our viewers panels have on, the extent to which people are optimistic. Who agrees with Liz that the promises that have been made, generally speaking, have not been delivered? Those who agree with Liz. I think that is pretty... That is pretty much the majority of people who think that there's been a gap between what's been said and what's been delivered. Alexander Downer, governments haven't really done the job from our, uh, our audience here. Well, um, whatever the audience thing thinks will be influenced by what the media reports. So let's just think about this for a minute. Um, in relation to my own country, Australia, we made commitments going back to the Kyoto Protocol in the late 1990s, and we fulfilled all those commitments. In Paris, we made a commitment to reduce our emissions by 26 to 28% by 2030. We will exceed that. We'll reduce our emissions by 35% by then. So that's a forecast. What we've done so far since 2005 is reduce our emissions by 20%. Now, let me make one other point. It is incredibly challenging for any government to, on the one hand, address the climate change issue, which they need to, and reduce emissions. On the other hand, make sure people are not plunged into poverty, into darkness, or suffer in any other way. It is hugely challenging. Um, And I think many Western governments... I I do think the British government... Um, certainly the Australian government, I think the Americans are doing quite a good job, are trying to get this balance right. The Australian government um, has has, uh, more than exceeded the commitments that it made, um, and and has made, including in Paris. So, um, you know, I think we, we obviously, in different countries have to meet our commitments in different ways because our economies are all structured in completely different ways. What you do in Australia is not relevant to the UK or Belgium or California. We're all different. So we have to have the flexibility to work out ways of getting CO2 emissions down. Be realistic, I think. You're being being asked to be realistic now. I think this is absolutely ludicrous and actually quite insulting to a lot of small island states that um, it's being made out that um, the Australian government is doing so much and Australia is not trying to phase out fossil fuels at all. There doesn't seem to be any plans really for that in in the the timescale that we actually need it to happen. And also, I think it really frustrates me when we talk about this as if it is a debate between... Or if, as if it's an equal debate between like either protecting people's lives and stopping people from being plunged into poverty or tackling the climate crisis. Because the reality is, is that the climate crisis will cause so much harm and destruction all around the world if we do not tackle it adequately. And so that should be the priority. But not only that, but if we actually have governments in power and people in power and policies that prioritise justice within this transition, then we can actually create a better world for all of us where we don't have a lot of the issues that we currently have now. It's not just about stopping the bad stuff. It's also about starting good things as well. All right, Alexander? Well, I mean, the Australian government has met its commitments and it's exceeded its commitments, so continual assertions and attacks on the Australian government aren't going to change the facts. And the facts are that Australia is doing very well. Now, the problem, the problem is that Australia's starting point was very different from other countries as one of the the world's great energy and resource exporters. And, of course, Australian exports have helped to drive the reduction in poverty in countries like China, Japan, South Korea and so on. But we all recognise we've got to do something to reduce CO2 emissions and there has to be a transition 
to low emission energy, and countries like Australia are making a major effort to do that. All right, I don't that's... think it's fair to say we're insulting to our neighbours. Australia does more for the countries of the Pacific Islands than almost any other country or and I could go further, than any other country on Earth we, in we, assisting those countries. We could spend a long time on that, but I want to come back to our wall. Um, I'm going to talk to Ron Knox, because I've noticed that Ron... Um, good evening again. Uh, Ron, I, I gather that uh, you're a bit sceptical about what you're hearing. Why? I'm sceptical because I don't know what it will take for the world to finally wake up. What catastrophe needs to happen before the world finally wakes up to what's going on here. And what I'm seeing is a lack of political will to make the necessary changes to provide the necessary finance that's going to make a difference. And that political will will only come from people. All right? We've already seen how minds can change when people force that change. Mm -hmm. And to me, this is the most classic issue of where political will will be generated and indeed controlled by the will of the people. You take us on to the next part, piece of ground I want to explore, which is whether politicians would have gone as far as they did without pressure from activists, or are the likes of Michaela and Greta Thunberg really leading the way? That's coming up next. Is runaway climate change inevitable, despite the agreement struck in Glasgow? That's this week's topic on The Great Debate. And would we be even further adrift without the relentless, strident and often angry protests from activists? Let's go to the walls to go to our viewers panel and talk to Farah Khan. Good evening again, Farah. Thank you for joining us. Um, what's your thought about this, the impact of activists? Activists, and especially young activists, are doing all that they can to create and protest for climate action. But my question is, when will world leaders take the future seriously? And will it be too late? How many cops do we need before humanity goes extinct? Well, OK, we're going to put that question to the panel in a moment. But I first want to talk to another viewer, uh, Jason McGilvery. And um, Jason... I think I'm right in saying that you were actually one of those activists who were protesting uh, in Glasgow. Is that right? Yes, I was. Um, I felt driven to go to it um, just in the current climate crisis. And um, I feel that we, we aren't doing enough. I mean, uh, COP26 to me seems like a bit of a cop out. Um, I believe we should be doing more. Uh, the, the, the targets are there. We've, we've got maybe a decade, maybe more or less. Uh, we're not we're not hitting the targets quick enough, you know. Um, it's easy enough for all these talking shops to take place, and they all fly in. But unless they're actually doing stuff on the ground, unless they're getting the big players involved, like China, India, um, yeah, then it, but, it's, it's a bit of a talking shop, you know. That's it, you know. Let's bring it back into the studio. The question that Farah has asked is: When will world leaders start to take climate crisis seriously? Allegra, you can hear the authentic, furious voice of youth. Did it make the blindest bit of difference in the negotiations that were going on? Of course it does. It, 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 it's, it's, it, it keeps the pressure up. It reminds everybody of what it's all about, if, if indeed they needed, needed reminding. But the, the, the thing I would like to take issue with is the idea that COP26 was a talking shop. Um, I understand why people feel that summits in general are... But I personally don't think that COP26 was one because you saw actually real world commitments being wrung out of other countries. And a and couple of really critical things, as well as the real world commitments on coal, cars, cash and trees. But you also... One of the critical things that has come out this weekend is the finalisation of the Paris Agreement. And there's three areas in which that's the case, but one of them is on transparency. So now, in the future, we will have clear indicators of each and every country and where they're going, where they're on track and where they're not. I, I get what you're saying, but... Uh... To be honest, uh, you can't see it, but 
there's a couple of people on um, the wall who are going blah, blah, blah. Whatever you think is happening, it isn't necessarily cutting through to the people you need to convince. Which... Is it, 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 uh, look, uh, you know, I understand why people think summits in general are blah, 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 but do, do, they, do they think that getting every single country in the world to agree to phase down coal is, is blah, blah, blah? Do they, would they rather us not have had that in the document? OK. Christiana, what do you think? Does the, the protest... I mean, it, you know, it makes... For us, it's fantastic when I say us, journalists and television producers and whatnot, great pictures. Does it make any difference to what actually happens in the room when those decisions are being made? It does make a difference. As Allegra said, it definitely keeps up the pressure, but it is one of the pressure points. I think we have to see this much more holistically. First of all, science. That is where policy needs to be very firmly grounded. So the pressure from scientists has been incredibly helpful. The fact that they're screaming from the rooftops has been very, careful, uh, very helpful. Then you have the youth activists that are also grounded on science. On top of that, you have the forces of the market because the fact is that the technologies that are the solutions to climate change are now much more accessible and becoming much cheaper than legacy technologies. On top of that, you have growing litigation and companies are getting much more concerned. On top of that, you have some leading companies that have yep. understood that it is in their interest to decarbonize. And finally, okay. you have changing customer demand. So it's not about one pressure point. It's about stacking all of this together. And that is actually what moves governments forward. Michaela, I, I want to put one question to you about all of this. I'm guessing that you are on the side of Farah and Jason who think that the uh, activists, the demonstrations, made a big difference. When they were making that decision, because we watched it happening live on the floor on Saturday evening to go from phasing out coal to phasing down coal, no number of demonstrations and placards could have stopped that happening, could it? I, I, I think that it definitely could. I think that we've seen it throughout happens. history... Yeah, no, but I'm saying that like the more people that we have behind a movement, the more change we see happens. And that's why we need even more people behind this movement than have currently been part of it. Because the more people we have, the more impact we'll have. Throughout history, we've seen that change isn't this passive thing. Things don't just get better like out of nowhere. They get better because people force them to be that way. And that's why I think that if we'd had even more campaigning around, especially around oil and gas and other fossil fuels, because I think so often in this conversation, India and China are being used as a scapegoat for this. They're being used as a scapegoat for the, the issue around phase down and phase out, when actually, if there'd been inclusion of all fossil fuels, which would include nations like the UK, like um, EU governments, like the US, who are actually more dependent upon oil and gas than they are of coal, then that would have been a, a kind of an agreement with encompassing all of these countries. Right, we'll keep that thought in mind, because after the break, we're going to be asking, should the developed world have done more to persuade other countries to give up on fossil fuels? This is the great debate, and this week we're assessing the COP26 climate conference and asking, is runaway climate change now inevitable? A crucial stumbling block at the talks was the issue of adaptation finance. That's the money promised by rich countries to help poor countries out cut emissions, and that was something that our viewers panel wanted to talk about too. So I'm going to go to David Young. David, you are in Northampton. What's yes. your thought on this? First of all, Trevor, thank you for the opportunity to be able to be on the programme and really at least have a voice in this argument. Look, I really think that we can talk all day about green industrial revolution. We are thousands of miles away from people that are dying. It's OK for that politician in Australia or our politician, Boris, in England, or any one of us to say, you know, well, that's OK. We're going to have the 20 years. Now, these people are dying. 197 countries were at that summit, and I watched every single day with you guys on Sky. But the point of the matter is here, look. What is our responsibility to developing countries that face immediate climate consequences? OK. Thank you very much, David, to our studio panel. Uh, that question from David again. 
What is our responsibility to developing countries that face immediate climate consequences? Alexander. Well, I think um, we all have a responsibility to humanity to do what we can to address this issue. Just to put it in context, um, since 2005, emissions in China have increased by around 80% and emissions in India by around 70% whereas emissions in Western countries have actually declined. Um, so um, the challenge, I mean, given the huge size of China's economy, the challenge is to see what can be done to get China's emissions down. Um, now, you can't order the communist government in China to reduce its emissions. You can only um, do what you can to persuade them to do that. Um, and I think, to be honest with you, um, through COP, 26, but through diplomacy over quite some years, some progress is being made to do that. The $100 billion um, dollars is designed to help finance adaptation policies in developing countries. But, you know, how do you spend $100 billion? You don't just give somebody a $100 billion cheque. There has to be accountability and transparency mm. in how the money is spent if you know what I mean. Yes, okay. um, And it has, to be, it has to be done carefully, so that takes time. But I think developed countries are, are, are prepared to pay. But remember, throughout all of this process, throughout all of this okay. process, no government is going to ruin its own economy in addressing this issue. It's not going to ruin okay. it and put people out of work and destroy the structure of their own society. Yeah. They're not going to do that. And that needs to be understood in this debate. Um, Christiana Figueres, uh, what Alexander Downer says is realistic, isn't it? I mean, uh, we can say that this is a kind of selfishness and so on, but governments get elected to look after their own people. Yes, but South Africa is uh, actually a pretty compelling case because, number one, it has uh, the highest solar rooftop penetration in the world. Uh, it has one of the highest concentrated solar potentials in the world. It has probably, because of where it is geographically, it can easily become the number one producer and exporter of green hydrogen. So it's not like Australia doesn't have an option. The fact that, for example, just to com just to compare South Africa, which does have a policy to move out of coal, was able to secure $8.5 billion to transition out of coal at COP26 proves the difference. If you have a policy that you understand coal is actually the root of all poverty and of much disease around the world and you commit to transitioning out of it, you will get support for it. If you hang on to a a, a fuel that was great in the past century but has no place in this century, well, you're digging your own grave. OK, Alexander, I guess I've got to give you the chance to respond to that. Yeah, well, Australia is transitioning out of uh, coal-fired power stations in, in, increasingly to gas and using wind and, and solar power. It's invest the government is investing $20 billion between now and 2030 in, um, in new technologies, particularly hydrogen and solar technologies. I mean, I don't, I, okay. everything is being done which okay. realistically could be done. And, then, and you know, Australia, uh, runs, Australia runs a great deal better than South Africa and people's living standards are better in Australia than uh, South Africa. Uh, so they're not Stratton. doing too bad a job. Allegra Stratton, I don't want to get too... As fun as it might be for us Brits to, to, to talk about Australia all the time, I don't want, get, don't want to get stuck on one country. Isn't there an issue here that, number one, the rich countries, taken overall, haven't really done what they said, and they certainly haven't done what some of the poor countries want. The 100 billion that Christiana Figueres mentioned earlier hasn't turned up. Yep. And on top of that, isn't the problem here that the biggest emitters, China and India, seem to get off scot-free from criticism? Lots of questions there, Trevor. Um, firstly, on the 100 billion, the, the PM and Alok Sharma 
have not hidden the fact that it is a, of deep regret. In fact, it's, it's, it's in, it's in the, the, the Glasgow pack that I've got here. It's there in black and white, you know. It's a regret, a disappointment to us that we didn't get... But they all promised it 12 years ago. Still hasn't happened. Hold on a second. It will be hit in 2023. That is late. And for countries on the front line, if we listen to the Marshall Islands or Tuvalu and so on, they are, they are already uh, seeing parts of their land go underwater. So this is here already for them. It's not something that happens in the future. So we have acknowledged that all the way through. No point in dressing that up. It is late. But even so, when you get to 2023, it does start to go up quickly and over the 100 billion. And over the point 21 to 25, okay. it's more than 500 billion. So it's essentially a, a problem of, of backloaded money. I'm not trying to get away from the fact that it will be hit late. It's just that the money is coming. Um, and then there's a, there's a second point, which isn't so much about money, but is more about technology and about spreading good lower carbon tech. And that's one of the parts that the Prime Minister and Alok Sharma feel is so exciting about this place that we find ourselves in now. And to your point about the duty that the rich world has to those places that are struggling, there, there is that recognition from the Prime Minister. He talked about that in his opening ceremony speech. We do have a responsibility, right. and that is to share all of this technology. Coming up, do we all have to change how we live? And what should we do? We'll be discussing that with the film director, Richard Curtis, founder of the Make My Money Matter campaign. Is runaway climate change inevitable? And what should we all do to try to prevent it? Let's talk to Jim Dale. Jim, you're in High Wycombe. You've got yeah, an evening. idea, I think. Uh, good evening, uh, Trevor. Yes, and the panel as well. Um, first, I, sh I should first admit that, I, that uh, I've got a... Uh, an intrinsic in interest in this particular area. I'm a meteorologist and I've been a meteorologist for the last 30 odd years. Surely the focus as well now, the, the Titanic has hit the iceberg, the iceberg is sinking and the Titanic has got burning deck chairs that were moving around while it sinks at the same time, if you get my drift. That's what's basically happening. So the focus now has got to be on, particularly on, on how we, uh, how, how the world really uh, faces up to the consequences of, of the last 30 years of doing not a lot. OK. What have you got out of that for our panel here? Uh, sorry, when you say... Question, what have what I got, What is your though? question for our, our studio guests? Well, I, I want to ask the panel how they see the world preparing for the consequences, the impact consequences, of a rise of more than a couple of degrees and probably more than that uh, in, in time to come. What's, what's, the, what's the world now doing to prepare for that um, in terms of the, the, the catastrophes that are likely to, to unfold? OK, well, Jim's got a pretty apocalyptic question there. How is the world preparing for the consequences of a rise of more than two degrees? Before I want put that to uh, our other guests, I, I want to talk to Richard Curtis, uh, the film director, who is in Los Angeles, who's actually um, got some thoughts about the way that people can prepare perhaps to avert that catastrophe. Good evening, Richard. Um, Hi, Trevor, good to see what, you. What is, what is your view about this? What can we do? Well, look, I think, uh, you know, this is such an interesting discussion, and I think that it's great that everybody acknowledges, you know, that we are on a war footing, and when you're on a war footing, everybody has to do their part. And I'm very interested in what we as individuals, you know, can do, how we can use our money and particularly affect business. So I'm obsessed by pensions. There's 3.1 trillion in the world pension pot. And a lot of us have got money still in businesses that are in deforestation, arms, uh, old style fossil fuels. And we all have the power to go into work tomorrow and say, has our company changed its pension into a sustainable pension? You know, that's the biggest chunk of money that we've got. So all these personal things in terms of buying sustainable foods, getting renewable energy, changing our flights. I think all of us every single day 
have to not, as it were, we should put and demand a lot of politicians, but we're all part of it and we can do positive stuff ourselves. And there's a consumer revolution going on and businesses are starting to change. They've got to accelerate that change. The public can help them accelerate that change. The governments will listen to businesses as much as they ever listen to protesters. So I just want to, as it were, be part of it. And I think we have to try and be part of it every day. So the idea is that actually people would use the money that they put into pensions in some way, shape or form to essentially contribute to reforestation, uh, mitigation schemes and so on. I, I suppose... Exactly. What... You, exactly. You've got to find private money, as it were, invested money, which will go into the most interesting new technologies, into the firms that are doing the most on gender, race, climate, all these kind of things. And we have that simple power. Actually, there's a brilliant... Uh, Australian uh, uh, pension company called uh, My Future Super, which has been doing this. So we can all have some particular effect. And I don't think we mustn't feel powerless. We've got to be on the streets, but we've also got to be coming. And the first thing we can do is make sure that our money isn't supporting the bad things, but is supporting the good things. I suppose some, some people might say that's all very well, it's very nice. But actually, number one, the scale of the challenge is way, way beyond what we can do even with our pensions. And anyway, don't we elect people to solve these problems rather than us having to do this kind of thing? Well, no, that's where we've got to be really imaginative because you say the scale, but actually we've been part of shifting 900 billion pounds in the last two years into businesses that support sustainability. So that is an enormous amount of money. And also, you know, the government is part of this. We're actually make, trying to ask the government to mandate that pensions actually pay attention to climate things and demand transparency. So it's all part of that interaction between us as people who spend our money and drive the economy and the government policies that reflect that and businesses changing their behaviour. So it shouldn't be, I mean, sometimes it has to be us and them, but often our behaviours personally can shift the economics of the world. We are looking at a kind of revolution in consumer behaviour and indeed in capitalism, and we've got to be part of it rather than just waiting for it to happen. OK. Um, Allegra, an actual idea. Are you writing that down and <laughs> taking it to the Prime Minister tomorrow? Suffice it to say, uh, I am well aware of Richard Curtis's work and the brilliant campaigning of Make My Money Matter, um, because I think, I, I was surprised you didn't say it, Richard, that it's, I think it's been, uh, some studies show that, that um, asking tough questions of where your pension is invested is probably the most effective thing you can do. He's nodding his head. So it, it, it's, it's, it's off the charts effective if you want to change your carbon footprint uh, in, in the most meaningful way. Michaela Loach, um, of everybody who's in this discussion, you probably uh, are going to have the biggest pension fund because you're going to be saving longer than the rest of us. Is, is this an idea that you think is practical, worthwhile? Is this the, a pathway to change for you? I mean, I definitely think that divestment is a huge thing that we can do. So moving our money away from the bad stuff. Like so many banks in the UK currently invest in fossil fuels, like HSB, Barclays, all the main banks, they all invest in fossil fuels. Loads of pension funds also invest in fossil fuels. And that's a huge way that we can actually move that money and move that um, kind of demand away from there because in many ways, the money does have an impact on them. Um, I also really just want to actually touch on what was said before about um, adaptation and um, climate finance, because I think there was a quite dangerous um, kind of idea being spread as if um, the country, countries in the West um, will just be completely destroyed if they have to give any money back to the countries that have been historically harmed. I'm from Jamaica. Jamaica has experienced colonial violence historically from the UK, and it's currently being submerged by water because of rising sea levels that are being caused by emissions that are being emitted out in the UK and other um, countries like it. We have an opportunity, actually, that we could also like aid those countries like Jamaica and other countries that are also low-lying states in being able to adapt and also um, prepare for this, but also just to stop this from happening in the first place and mm. actually create a better world for all of us in the UK. We can provide jobs, we can um, provide safe housing. We have those policies okay. already and that technology, and we have to do it. I have to say or that. All right, um, there's a lot of agreement to that point, but I want to stay for the moment with Richard's idea about how individuals can make a difference. Um, Australia got a good write-up there, Alexander. Uh, there's nothing wrong with um, superannuation funds, as they're called in Australia, pension funds, um, investing their money in uh, 
green technologies, of course, and um, it sounds great and I'm in principle in favour of it. However, I would to say two things about finance. First of all, you do want to make sure if you're running a pension fund that you're running it profitably. Otherwise, you will not be able to pay out the pensions eventually. So just be a bit careful um, with too much virtue signalling. Secondly, um, Wait a it's second. quite Can I popular jump in there? to divest. Uh, it's quite popular. I will come to you in a second, Richard. It's yeah. quite popular. To, well, I'm sure these green investments are hugely profitable and that would be very good. Um, it's quite popular to say that pension funds and other institutions should sell out of fossil fuel companies. The thing is, they are selling out and those assets are being purchased, in particular, by private hedge funds who, because of recent very big increases in energy prices, have made a huge amount of money. Okay. So, you know, you need to think these things through and think about the finance, not okay. just be virtue signalling. OK, Richard Curtis, uh, your virtue signalling and, by the way, putting your hands in... Uh, putting yourself in the hands of um, some ghastly capitalists. Well, wait a minute. Virtue signalling, that's... That, by the way... Some bad virtue capitalists. Si virtue signalling is, is, is a really... That is completely the wrong term for moving your money to support the best new businesses. I mean, that is an atrocious way to treat it. And sustainable and ethical pensions are doing as well, if not better. I mean, I've checked this with every single bank. I've talked to Mark Carney about it. It's just not true. That's an old fashioned truth and shift. Things have shifted really over the last five years. And this is a positive, serious way of doing it. And the issue of divestment is a very interesting one, but it's not a black or white thing. And you'll find that pensions are really looking at which oil companies are doing the most and they're supporting those most and they will most thrive and the public will most support them. Uh, I, I'm, I really think this is a serious discussion about the use of money, about making our financial footprint affect our carbon footprint, and not a token thing at all. People's pensions are the biggest chunk of money they've got, and they should be using that as intelligently, as well-informed, with, with the best pension companies that they can to make a difference to the world and make those businesses thrive and improve the economy through those thriving businesses. Okay. Uh, I want to come back to the wall and talk to... Um... Some of you talked to before is a small businessman, Robin Gillingham. Um, you're a small business owner in, in Devon. We talked before about taxes and so on. Uh, yeah. What do you make of this proposal? Where are you? Uh, are you with Richard Curtis on this? Um, I think, um, I mean, everybody's got a, a point of view and it all it generally makes sense. Um, first of all, I wanted to say that COP26, I think, has been a, a good success. It's brought the uh, world together. It's also been a, a good platform for the activists to have their say. Um, and obviously, it's created great awareness for the challenges that we face. Um, obviously, there's a frustration uh, with the lack of action or the perceived lack of action um, from the corporations and subsequently world leaders. Um, but I think we've got to be frank, we do live in a capitalist society, a uh, majority of us, and that obviously is now literally ruling the waves. Um, so if the world leaders uh, cannot enforce change or if it's not being uh, perceived as being quick enough, then maybe consumers uh, should take it into their own hands and uh, take it upon themselves um, basically to live a more sustainable lifestyle. And let's lead the way. Christiana Figueres, you've um, been fighting this particular fight for much longer than most. Um, what do you, where are you on this? Can we turn our savings to good use in this respect? Well, we have to. It's the only prudent thing to do. I definitely don't want to have my savings in stranded assets, meaning that not only am I doing a crime against humanity, but I'm actually losing the value of my hard-earned money. And the fact is, as Richard has already pointed out, the fact is that the finance sector as a whole has woken up to realize that if they want to protect the value of their portfolios, they have to move over. So in Glasgow, we had 450 financial institutions from 45 countries with over $130 trillion in assets across all the major segments of the finance sector, including asset owners, asset managers, insurers, commercial banks, investment consultants, stock exchanges, credit rating agencies, everyone saying we are going to net zero. So let me come back to 
the wall and put to you where we are. We started this conversation asking whether it's inevitable that runaway climate change has gone past the point of no return. And I want to see where you now stand. Can I see that hands who believe that we can, hearing what you've heard, we can slow it down? Those who think that we still have the possibility of slowing down climate change. And I think I'm seeing quite an optimistic return there. And, uh, some, seeing something 50, 50 60% looks to me, uh, actually more than that, who think that we can do something about this. That's all we have time for this evening. And uh, it just remains for me to say thank you to our panellists tonight. Alexander Downer, Allegra Stratton, Michaela Loach, Christiana Figueres, and of course, Richard Curtis. And of course, I want to say thank you to our viewers panel, as robust and in there as ever. We're waving goodbye to you. Thank you so much. And of course, Thanks to you at home for watching. Keep the debate going, keep talking. That was The Great Debate.